What's up guys, this is Chris here, and today we're gonna to be talking about seven guns that are not worth the money. We're gonna be going over a couple specific guns and a couple of categories of guns that I think just aren't worth your hard earned cash. These days, people are trying to get good guns for as low price as they can, which I totally understand, and I think that most people would wanna avoid the guns on this list. Now, I picked these based on my personal experience and my personal bias, so I wanna put that ahead of time, but my experience is more vast than most. I've been reviewing guns now for eight years, and I shoot about 50 different guns a year, and I shoot about 50,000 rounds a year, so hopefully my opinion has enough weight to help you guys out. Before we get into the video, I do wanna mention my patron supporters. Thank you guys very much. It's because of you we have lots of these terrible guns on the channel, and I appreciate you for it. If you wanna support the channel, all you have to do is go to the link in the description below and sign up. Also in that description is a link to a local shelter named Zywa. So YSS, these kids could use your help, so please go down to the description of this video and donate to those kids. Starting off, this video is gonna be a bit of a shit show. I'm gonna be a little all over the place because we have rain coming in, I'm trying to beat the wind, the weather's been crazy for the last few days, so bear with me. That being said, we'll get right into it with number seven, and that is going to be the M&P 22 Magnum. Now the M&P 22 Magnum is a gun I really wanted to love, I'm gonna be honest with you. I love the M&P 5.7 a lot, it was actually on my previous top five, and I really enjoyed that gun, and they sort of took what was good about the M&P 5.7 and made a 22 Magnum. The downside is, is that it's a 22 Magnum. <laughs> and then it has 22 Magnum related problems. Well, that almost seemed too easy too. Well, that's 75 yards. <laughs> Shall we go back? Oh shit, look at that. I had a Keltec 22 Magnum a long time ago, and it had a lot of reliability issues, and I kind of attributed it to just being a Keltec because, you know, it is what it is. That being said, I got the M&P version of it, and this gun still malfunctions with a good portion of the rounds that I put in the gun. It's around the same price as the M&P 5.7, has very similar features, very similar shootability. As a matter of fact, if you put them back to back, it's hard not to notice one gun from the other. However, the 22 Magnum caliber is a little bit cheaper than the 5.7. When this gun came out, it was a lot cheaper. Nowadays, they're similar in price depending on where you go. 22 Magnum is always gonna be cheaper, but since it is a rimfire cartridge, I feel that it is inferior to the 5.7 as far as reliability, or at least the M&P 22 Magnum. All right, so this is the 22 long rifle right here. This guy is the 22 Magnum. The longest of the four is the 5.7, the FN 5.7 ammo right here, and this is just a Blazer Brass 9mm 115 grain. This is the shortest, but the fattest, and you can see kind of the disparity in length and size. I feel like you're gonna be way better off spending your hard-earned cash on the M&P 5.7 itself. I feel like it performs a little bit better, and I feel like it's a lot more reliable with the exact same features, ergonomics, and trigger. This is a cool-looking gun, don't get me wrong. It has a red dot mount with cool sights. It has a really good trigger, really good ergonomics, and the features on it are absolutely excellent for the price. That being said, it doesn't go bang when I want, so I don't recommend it. In at number six, we have the Beretta Cheetah 80X. This is the brand new Beretta Cheetah, and I know this is gonna be a really controversial one, especially for all the Italian fans out there, which I understand. First off, it is a very cool gun. It looks neat. However, I just don't feel like in modern day society, it fills a niche for most people. I know for you hardcore Beretta Tomcat fans out there and your hardcore Beretta Cheetah fans out there, you're definitely gonna pick one of these up, and obviously I did as well. That being said, for the average concealed carry person, it is probably too much money, too much bulk, and too little performance. It shoots well, it has a decent capacity. However, the ergonomics aren't very good for large hands. That's the first hit. The second hit is it's over double the price of guns like the Ruger Security 380, which has the same capacity, it's lighter weight, it has the same recoil, it's probably a little bit better to shoot in my personal opinion, and again, half the cost. Now where it really gets crazy is when you compare this to guns like the Ruger Max or the Darling of 2024, the Smith & Wesson Bodyguard 2.0. Those guns are less than half this size, carry a similar capacity, only three rounds different, they're just as shootable, and again, much lower in price. So overall, unless you're a Beretta collector, I feel like the 80X is probably better off for gun tubers and 
for collectors. In at number five, we have souped up lever guns. Now, this hurts my soul a little bit to put on here, but the reality is, is I just don't recommend them to average people. Now, if you wanna look cool like the dude in John Wick, you definitely can do that. And souped up lever guns have definitely been really on fire over the past two years because of all the restrictions that shitty states have been putting down on their civilians. People have been trying to put M-Lock rails, Surefires, and EOTechs on guns from 1873, <laughs> which, looks cool and it was a very steampunk vibe for quite a while however if you're going to be realistic about it spending three thousand dollars let's say on a custom henry or marlin looks cool it looks awesome on the wall and it shoots okay for a lever gun but it's heavy it's bulky and it's nowhere near the performance of something like an ak or an ar-15 and the reality is you either buy that because it's cool or you buy it because you're in a state that infringes your rights and while i like the option for people that are in let's say maryland or Connecticut or whatever state that doesn't <laughs> allow you to have firearms, but I feel like these guns are way overpriced for what they are. I think that a lever gun that costs $3,000 is a bit ridiculous unless it's a collector item like a Winchester 1873. Just because of the performance you get, I still have reliability issues even when those guns are done up by good gunsmiths. I've had parts problems with rails from several companies, and I just don't feel like you get the performance from the gun. I feel like you don't get the performance from the accessories because they're not vetted by any sort of military organization. There's no special operations community out there running M-Lock rails on a Rossi 92, if you get what I'm saying. So I feel like they're great for a novelty item, but I feel like for a self-defense item, they're not really all that great. I mean, I think they're okay, but I feel like they're probably just as good plain stock, if not maybe a little bit better. If you want to get a self-defense lever action rifle, I would probably just get like a stock Henry or stock Marlin, and I would run with that. I also feel like like for the money, you can get so much cooler guns. I mean, I have lever guns that are three, three and a half thousand dollars, and you could get a six arc AR-15 for a third of that price that would shoot a thousand yards. And I just sort of feel like for the performance to price ratio, they're not worth it. Cool, but not for most people. In at number four, we have a gun that definitely deserves to be on this list, the Tommy Built T36, or let's go ahead and just say the Tommy Built pretty much everything I've ever tried. I love the Tommy Built series because they look very cool, but I always remind people that that's pretty much all they do. I actually had a Tommy Built T36, which I really wanted and spent over $3,000 on, and it functioned about as well as your average Keltec. Now, I felt like maybe I was duped, so I ended up selling that gun to a buddy who really wanted it and then I purchased a new one. Lo and behold, my new one functions the exact same way. I still didn't want to believe it because I wanted confirmation bias. I wanted my gun to work. So I gave it to my buddy Nick who also couldn't run it at all. Any type of ammunition, any magazines that you buy still absolutely sucks. And then I watched Grandfam's video about the brand new HK MP7 clone that Tommy Built made that I was super excited about and I was ready to buy. And again, glad I wasn't because what a surprise, it was a shit box too. Overall, I think they look great on the wall, but if you want it to work, buy H&K or don't bother. In at number three, we have cheap 2011s. Now, cheap 2011s, I just don't feel like they're worth the money. If you go with, let's say, the Gerson 2011, which kind of facilitated this, I feel like you get all the negatives of the 2011 with none of the pros for a cost that you could buy a solid polymer frame 9mm. And if you look at the Gerson 2011, it has a 7, 8, 10 pound trigger on it. It was very unreliable. The optics mounting system sucked. And if you're buying a 2011, you want it to be fast and accurate. That's why you're paying the money. If you you're gonna get a 2011, that's what you expect. And if you're paying seven, $800 and you realize your buddy's PDP that's 500 bucks has a better trigger, it's more accurate, more reliable, and he's fucking laughing at you over there for buying a Turkish 1911, I think you're gonna regret your purchase. So that's why it's on this list. Honestly, if you wanna get in the 2011 game, I wouldn't recommend going any lower than the Springfield Prodigy. And even then I err on the side of iffy because you're spending $1,500 on a gun that might perform, it might not. You might be better off just saving your money and getting a staccato or spend 950 bucks on a shadow two that'll never let you down in at number two man another unpopular one bullpup rifles so if you don't live in the uk or maybe in the european union i feel like bullpup rifles are probably not worth the money for you especially if you live in the united states 
The reason I say that, because I've had a lot of bullpup rifles. I've had the Tavor, I've had the AUG, I've had several Desert Techs, and many more, including probably my personal favorite, the Springfield Hellion. That's a very cool gun made by HS Products over in Croatia, and it is a military firearm that performs really well. The downside to all of those guns is they're $2,000 and up, and AKs and AR-15s exist. And I sort of feel like if you are going to run them, you're gonna realize pretty quickly there are a lot of drawbacks to bullpup rifles, for the pros that most people tout. Bullpup rifles usually have the action in the rear of the rifle, which allows you to have a full 16 inch barrel with the magazine in the rear, so you can have a shorter overall package without losing velocity. The downside to that is now you're doing everything in your armpit. You're reloading in your armpit, you're clearing malfunctions in your armpit, hell, you might even be sniffing your armpit while you're down there. The reality is, is I feel like you sacrifice not only a lot of ergonomics for them, but you sacrifice a huge amount of cost in the United States as a civilian. To be honest with you, bullpup rifles were supposed to be the future when I was a kid, but now if you look at the militaries around the world, all the militaries that have ran bullpups pretty much have switched over to standard rifles again. Those who used to run maybe the FAMAS or many other guns now run the HK416. And I just think that's because of the ease of use, the ease of clearing malfunctions, and the overall nice ergonomics of the AR-15. Add to the fact that modern day ARs can be had at a solid quality for or around the price of $700 and up, saving you enough money to buy an optic, a thousand rounds of ammunition, tons of mags, a sling, and would you even believe it, some training. So you can get a full complete kit for less than the cost of a slick standard AUG, and I feel like for most people, they're just not worth the money. That being said, if you fucking love Die Hard, or maybe you've played a lot of Call of Duty and you really want a bullpup, I think a couple of them will serve you well, and if I was gonna recommend them, I would definitely go with the Hellion, the AUG, a three or the X95 by IWI. That being said, again, all guns over $2,000 and will definitely not be worth the money if you're just looking for a solid home defense rifle. All right, there won't be any honorable mentions for this list because I am literally drowning. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I feel a lot like Paul Harrell, to be honest with you. I always thought Paul was the man when he was out filming videos and it was just fucking pouring rain, but I figured that was just what people in Oregon do. But here we are in Iowa, and I know it probably looks nice and warm out here, but it's actually about 35 degrees, and I'm trying not to shiver and look like a bitch before I get to you, your number one. Your number one is any AR-15 over $2,000. Now, I know that's gonna hurt a a lot of people because I have tons of AR-15s over $2,000. I love my Noveskis, I love my V7s, I love my Daniel Defenses, but do they do anything that BCM doesn't do? Not really. Not for most people. And I would argue, do they do anything that an IWI doesn't do? I would argue for most people, absolutely not. If you're looking for sub one inch groups at let's say 50 or 100 yards, maybe this group includes you. If you're gonna be a Delta operator who's gonna shoot 40,000 rounds a year and you can buy your own kit, maybe you should get a Noveski, maybe you should get a Daniel Defense. But I think for most people, the reality is, is I think $1,500 is probably the most you ever need to spend on an AR-15 for home defense, even for three gun competition, taking a training class, I think anything around the $1,000 to $1,500 price point is gonna serve you extremely well. I've had Bear Creek Arsenals, I've had Palmettos, I've had Radical Firearms, and I've had many other rifles that are under $700 that would do 1,000 or 2,000 rounds without a malfunction, as long as they were properly lubed. Now, I wouldn't recommend those unless you are a hobbyist and you only plan on shooting once in a while, but again, there are tons of solid ARs from Springfield to Sig to IWI all the way to BCM, which is my personal favorite, but there are so many more that are between 12 and 15 and $1,800 that are so durable, so accurate, so reliable, and they come with solid ergonomics, M-lock rails, quality triggers, and sights right out of the box. So I feel like these days in the 2024 edition, if you're spending over $2,000 for an AR-15, you're probably doing it just because you want to and just because you think it's cool, and at the end of the day, that's absolutely okay. Okay. All of these guns, if you want to buy them just because you think they look cool, that's totally fine. Nobody should tell you what you should do with your money. I'm just warning you in case you didn't know. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Please step out your local homeless shelters and remember to recycle. I'll check you later.